ladies and gentlemen good day and welcome to q4 and fy23 earnings conference call of nazara technologies limited hosted by jm financial as a reminder all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes should you need assistance during the conference call please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touch tone phone please note that this conference is being recorded i now hand the conference over to mr abhishek kumar from jm financial thank you and over to you sir thank you shashi uh, good morning everyone uh, welcome to this call of nazara technologies <clears throat> to discuss fourth quarter and full year fy23 results we have with us the management team of nazara represented by mr nitesh mr sain ceo and managing director mr sudhir kamath chief operating officer mr rakesh shah group chief financial officer and ms anupriya sinha das head of corporate development with that let me now hand over the call over to mr mitish nitish mr sain for his opening remarks thank you and over to you nitish good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you to nadara technologies limited q4 and fy23 earnings call we have uploaded our results presentation on the exchanges and i hope you have had the opportunity to go through the same We are delighted to report another milestone year for Nazara. We have delivered a strong performance in FY23 with revenues surpassing the 1,000 crore INR mark for the first time at INR 1,091 crores, and our EBITDA coming in at INR 109.7 crores. Revenue growth was at 75.5 percent year on year, with an overall EBITDA of 10.1 percent and a year on year 21% fat growth the healthy year on year revenue growth across all business verticals including gaming esports and ad tech demonstrates a commitment to drive growth aggressively alongside profitability while prioritizing growth so that we can achieve scale and market leadership in the spaces we operate in in terms of our performance for the quarter gone by revenue grew by 65% year on year to INR 289.3 crores EBITDA grew by 86% to INR 27.7 crores and the PAT increased by 92% year on year to INR 9.4 crores the company is currently operating in three key segments uh, which are gaming esports and ad tech our gaming segment comprising of sub segments namely gamified early learning premium rng and telco distribution generated a total of inr 406.3 crores which was up 28% year on year uh, and delivered an ebitda margin of 17.5% our esports business generated inr 531.5 crores in revenue up 74.9% with a 7.8% margin and our ad tech business generated 153.2 crores in revenue with a 8.8% margin through our acquire and scale model we continue to address pre identified white spaces in our existing business segments via strategic acquisitions while being focused on profitable and sustainable growth of our existing businesses our existing businesses are generating cash which is being redeployed first to drive organic growth and thereafter for acquisitions as can be seen in the recent sports leader and pro football network deal this operating model enables us to create a flywheel that keeps gaining momentum across stable growing and diversified cash flow generating businesses in the spaces we operate on the mna side we will continue to expand our presence in gaming esports and ad tech the current market environment provides us with several attractive opportunities and we are continuing to work actively towards the same lastly on the skill based uh, real money gaming space the emerging regulatory clarity is a huge positive for our industry uh, the ministry of it has recently issued a framework for operating skill based rmg and clarity on online gaming tts that was provided in the budget and thereafter has also been helpful while clarity on gst is yet to emerge we are hopeful that this will get resolved in the coming months since currently skill based rmg is only 5% of our total revenues it provides a significant scale of opportunity for us going forward and with regulatory clarity emerging we are working on a three pronged approach towards the same uh, through growth in our existing games 
launching and publishing new rng games and acquiring existing rng companies to drive scale for ourselves in the sector i would now like to hand over the call to anupriya to give some highlights on our specific business segments over to you anupriya thank you nitish good morning everyone uh, as you are aware nazara operates a total three segments gaming e sports and ad tech gaming includes gamified early learning gear money gaming premium and telco distribution sub segment this segment grew by 28% contributed to 37% in revenues and 56% in ebitda in fy23 our play book here is to invest in user acquisition backed by unit economics while focusing on product and content updates to drive retention metrics all our key ips continue to see growth if you look at kidopia which is a flagship it within gamified early learning segment We continue to see subscriber growth in Q4 FY23, despite negative impact of seasonality. As we know, Q3 is the festive season in the US, and Q4 typically sees a pullback. But in spite of that, we have seen a growth in the subscribers for Kidopia. The subscriber number increased to 311,758 in March 2023. Kidopia continues to be the number two grossing app for kids under five years in the US. EBITDA margin for the business improved to 18.4% in Q4 FY23 versus 11.6 in Q3 FY23, given by cost per trial reduction to $35.9 in Q4 from $37.3 in Q3. Moving on to Animal Jam, which is another IP in our gamified early learning segment, we are setting the platform for growth and retention. The team has worked on improving the analytics backend to get actionable product and user acquisition insights. On the product side, we have improved the cadence of content updates to drive growth. We are leveraging group capabilities for user acquisition via data work. The emphasis on optimization on a long core cost has led to an improvement in EBITDA margin from 3% in Q3 to 11.6% in Q4 FY23, and we continue to we expect this upward trajectory to continue. Moving to WCC World Cricket Championship. We have significantly improved monetization of users, leading to 38% growth in ad revenue, 26% growth in overall revenue, and improvement in EBITDA margin from 19.1% in FY22 to 26.2% in FY23. We have also announced that we are acquiring an additional 19.5% stake in Next Wave Market Media, the holding company for WCC, and this transaction is expected to be completed in the next few days. Open Play, which is the which is Nazara's initial step into R&D space, we've seen a revenue growth of 33% year on year in FY23, and EBITDA growth of 79% year on year due to better cost optimization. We wheeled out players that were not generating revenue but consuming bonus. We are further improving the acquisition funnel, branding, and player journey. Tamil Nadu banned online games with chance of money, including Rummy and Poker, in April 2023. Tamil Nadu contributed to 20% of our revenue and FY23. Hence, the ban will have a short-term negative impact on the business. However, we are trying to actively mitigate this downside risk. As Nitish mentioned, with new regulatory clarity emerging for the R&D segment, we are working on a larger blueprint for Nazara in the R&D space while using organic and inorganic levers. Moving to our e-sports segment. Which contributes to 49% of our total revenue. This segment grew by 75% in FY23. So specifically of Nordin, the revenue grew by 84% in FY23, driven by growth in multiple IPs. The IPs that have seen a strong growth are Playground, PUBG in South Asia, and Digimi, as well as a strong growth in wins are gaining access to these business. Operating leverage will kick in uh, this case. So we will see a non-linear growth in EBITDA to come from own IPs and media rights. Accessories business of, uh, to become margin accessible as brands get more strongly established. Nordwin has acquired 51% in branded PT Limited for a cash consideration of 1.3 million dollars. Singapore-based branded PT has built marquee IPs, including All That Matters, It's a Girl Thing, and Creator World. This acquisition will also drive sponsorship revenue for all of Northern IP in India and internationally. Fourth quarter revenues grew by uh, 55% in FY23 as US revenues grew by 
104% growth in revenue from esports in FY23 for sports gear. Direct brand uh, sales now contribute to 26.7 crores in FY23. This is more than double of the corresponding number in FY23. Sportskira acquired 73% stake in Pro Football Network, a premier source of coverage and analysis of NFL in the US in, in March 23 for $1.82 million. With more than 5 million MAUs, CSN is ranked third among the top NFL focused media websites in the US as per similar web rankings in January 2023. I think our newest growth engine also performed well and grew by 53% year on year in FY23. This segment contributed to 14% of revenues and 11% of EBITDA in FY23. DataWorks added 42 new clients in FY23, contributing to 34% of total revenues in the same period. The company lost one significant client, however, there will be a minimal, minimal EBITDA impact due to growth in new clients. DataWorks continues to build all three of its business units. ITV, which is the services for advertisers, MediaWorks, which is the services for publishers, and Visible, a self-serve demand-side platform. The company is ramping up sales capabilities globally and is also actively evaluating m and All our business segments continue to be cash generating. We close the year with 628.3 crores of cash in our balance. Our strong cash position not only provides financial strength for organic growth, but also allows us to deploy capital for strategic m and I'll close my remarks here and would like to open, call for, uh, open the call for q and I would request Nitesh Sudhir and Rakesh Shah to join me for the q and Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchdown telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have our first question from the line of Jinesh Zoshi from Prabhudas Liladas. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I have a question on the ethic business, which uh, seems to have reported a loss in this quarter. Uh, so can you highlight the reason behind it? Uh, I mean, has it got to do with the loss of clients, which uh, we just highlighted? And if yes, uh, what is the reason behind it? And how much did that client contribute to our business? And by when do you expect uh, uh, the business to stabilize from here on? That is question one. And just a follow-up on that is, uh, this time around, we have not disclosed the beta of headset in telco businesses. So you can just share that as well. Ganesh, I didn't hear your question. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, so the headset business uh, seems to have reported a loss in this quarter. Uh, so the question is, has it got to do with the loss of clients, which we just highlighted? If yes, what was the reason behind that loss and when do we expect the business to stabilize? Sure, thank you. Well, uh, second question also. Uh, the EBITDA, EBITDA figure for EdTech and Telco business, which we have not given in the PPT this time around, so if you can share those numbers. Sure, sure. Okay. So just to clarify the data works, the EdTech business is not close to the loss. It is uh, revenue of... Uh, 39 crores in uh, uh, in Q4 with uh, 2.7 crores of EBITDA. So it's profitable, it's posted at 6.9% uh, EBITDA in Q4. And uh, total EBITDA of 13.5 uh, crores for the year on revenues of 153.3 crores. <laughs> the total EBITDA being 8.8%. So business continues to be profitable. We mentioned uh, the the client that was contributing uh, revenues, uh, you know, for the low margin client. So we don't expect any, uh, you know, large impact on our EBITDA. And we expect that we will continue to do well uh, in the coming FY24. We've been actually adding a lot of new clients. We've also appointed some uh, sales teams in the U.S. We're actually on a pretty aggressive growth path over and feeling very confident about our business. 
on the telco business we had so 52.8 crores of revenue with 13.9 crores of EBITDA which was a 26.3% margin uh, sure, sir. Actually, I was looking at the EBIT number, which was negative, and hence the confusion. Uh, thanks, thanks for the clarification. Uh, sir, my second question is on uh, Nordwin. Uh, so, if I look at uh, the content views uh, that we have shared in the PPT uh, that have uh, gone up in FY23, uh, even the distribution hours are uh, up when I compare it with the last financial year. Uh, yes, the contribution of uh, media rights revenue has come down from about 39% uh, odd uh, to about 21% in, in this uh, financial year. Uh, so, so does it mean that uh, pricing has uh, taken a, a hit over here? If not, uh, can you explain the reason behind it? And also, if you can share, I mean, what kind of EBITDA margin can we make on, on uh, mature IP uh, solely from media rights licensing? Because apparently it appears to be a, a high margin business for us. So just wanted your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So so uh, on the media rights revenue, right, I think uh, for the FY23, why not percentage contribution has dropped, you know, from our absolute terms, uh, the revenues are brought, have been broadly flat for us. And uh, one of the large contributors for that reason is that, uh, you know, because of a lot of the popular memes got banned, some of the media deals we had in place kind of dropped off. We should have generated, you know, the significant uh, growth in media revenue. So I think despite uh, the games being banned, uh, you know, us being able to also maintain the media rights where they were was a good performance. And we expect in the coming year that to normalize. So that's one aspect. I think for a established IP with media rights, uh, you know, we should be able to get to uh, in the short near term, right, about 20-25% uh, kind of EBITDA margins. Once there is stability on the games, uh, the popular esports titles. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, sir. One one last question from my side. Uh, the PSN business uh, that we acquired uh, recently. Uh, apparently seems to uh, be marginally loss-making at the operating level uh, in, in CY22. So uh, just wanted to know what can be the uh, steady state of beta margin in this business and by when do you expect to achieve that? Dinesh, sorry, which business? The, the, pro, the pro football network business that Sportskid acquired, the PFN business. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think that's a fantastic uh, plug-in for Sportskid. It's a top three... Uh, destination in the U.S. Uh, and it depends uh, sports guitars uh, vertical in that space. The team there is fantastic. And uh, even its early days, we're already seeing some very strong uh, growth in KPIs. So we are very confident of uh, you know delivering good profits and good EBITDA on that business in the current year. Uh, uh, we think <coughs> uh, the synergies between sports Kida and PFN will play out very well. And we should see start seeing that from as early as you know this uh, next quarter. Would you like to share a indicative steady state EBITDA margin number over here? It's a very early uh, genius, so we, I'd like not to do that. Uh, sure, sir. Uh, thank you so much, and all the best. Thank you. A reminder to participants to press star and one to ask a question. We have a next question from the line of Abhishek Banerjee from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Yes, uh, a couple of questions. Firstly, on the cost for trial in Pidopia. Uh, Sir, I'm sorry. Can you use your handset mode, please? Hello? Yes. Is it fairer? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, well, first of all, a uh, great set of numbers. Uh, uh, just a couple of questions. First, on Kidopia, uh, the CPT decline uh, of close to $1.4. Uh, if you would give us some, uh, you know, clarity on how that happened and uh, what is your outlook uh, going forward? So could we see another, uh, you know, a dollar kind of decline in that CPT? Uh, which would have, uh, you know, very, very big impact on your margins going forward, uh, or, or is it likely to stabilize, uh, stabilize at this level? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, start on getting the right uh, optimum mix uh, of, uh, you know, cost for trial and the volumes that we are able to spend and acquire users. 
and I think Q4 because Q3 usually is the October to December Christmas season in the US and it's you know a peak season. Q4 usually is a bit slower and I think uh, we focused on optimizing our CPT in this period. Uh, you can see the result in front of you. I think there have been a lot of things we have done in the Kidopia business in the last few months, which includes the price increases. It includes, you know, uh, trying to start scaling up the volumes again. We've kind of overcome that IDFA issue, We've gone back to spending a lot on Google, uh, which we had earlier stocked. So I think this quarter has been for us to stabilize the business, just check out our, all our key metrics, healthy and stable, which we are finding they are. And I think uh, the way to look at it is uh, the CPT range uh, will still remain between this 35 to $37. Now our focus going forward is going to be how can we also parallelly start scaling up uh, some of the spend volumes uh, to start increasing the subscriber base. If you see in Q4, our EBITDA margin actually improved uh, quite significantly, 18.4%, uh, you know, versus success a quarter of 11.6%. So I think we're on the right track with Europia, uh, stabilizing the business and getting it back growth track. Got it. So, but, uh, I mean, on one hand, uh, you're saying that you stabilized the uh, uh, Kiropia business and, and CPDs came down. And even in a lean season, you managed to grow subscribers. So is there some uh, tailwind which uh, is happening in the sector? I mean, are people coming into the segment? I think uh, Kidopia business itself is uh, uh, the Kidopia app, right? Is uh, quite a loved app. Continues to be very, and the team continues to work very hard on the product side. Uh, as you might have seen, you know, even Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, recently came to India and met the Kidopia team and also tweeted about how Kidopia is impacting positively to kids all over all over the world. So that's a big validation of the product, and I think uh, that's what's helping us, uh, you know. I would say outperform competition. Understood. Uh, also, also in terms uh, of uh, you know the acquisition pipeline going forward. So, uh, so you have been very active in this space, right? Uh, but at some time, uh, you know, management bandwidth becomes a constraint. Uh, you know, to uh, to support such a wide portfolio. So. Uh, would you give us some parity on what kind of acquisitions you will uh, try to do in the next year? Yeah, I think uh, the flywheel we have, right, is a distributed flywheel. So what I mean is that, you know, let's take uh, Sportskeeda, for example. You know, Nazara went and acquired Sportskeeda three and a half years back and uh, grew it from, let's say, a 15 crores revenue to, uh, you know, this year's, uh, I think we've done one second. To yeah, post the 122 crores revenue, right, with the 38, 39 crores at the start this year. Three and a half years back, when we acquired the business, it had a you know a zero at the start. So this company has accumulated cash over the last two years, generating profits, and we built a strong management team there. We have a CEO in place, we have a chief strategy officer in place, who's very focused on M&A. And through our experience, we've kind of you know guided these teams and. The Pro Football Network is an acquisition done by Sportskeeda and is being completely managed by the Sportskeeda team under our guidance. So what this structure allows us is to continue doing this m &A activity without it sucking up a lot of our operational bandwidth at Nazara level. So while Nazara may be selective in doing acquisitions, you may see bolt-on acquisitions happen at a more rapid pace at the companies below because they are getting cash, accumulating cash, and it's a great deployment of uh, their cash to further their businesses. That's when we kind of bring in our experience and expertise in uh, you know, doing these transactions. But the actual operations of these M&As are uh, done by the teams you know, of the subsidiaries. I think that's working very well for us. At the Nazara level, I think our thought process going forward is that we will be taking fewer and larger bets on m and Whereas bolt on acquisitions will largely happen at the subsidiary level. Understood. Understood. And, and uh, if you're talking about larger acquisitions, uh, does that uh, mean, uh, you know, uh, taking on some leverage? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? So uh, if you're talking about larger acquisitions, does that mean taking on some debt? At this point of time, we've not, uh, you know, looked at it, but. Uh, 
I would say that from zero debt to moving to a low debt could be an option, but largely any debt, if we were to take it, would be purely against the cash flows of the target company and not uh, Venezuela. Understood. That is that is very clear. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Abhishek Bandari from Nomura. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Nitish, I had one question. If I go to your slide number 32, uh, you know, I'm just trying to reconcile, you know, the slowdown of EBITDA into operating cash flow. Uh, you know, while we generated 100 plus crore of EBITDA in FY23, uh, the yeah. net cash flow from operations is just around 8. Uh, part of it is explained because of, you know, working capital. But if you could, you know, elaborate, how are you thinking to, you know, bridge the gap between the two? Or is it, is it a nature of the business that this kind of gap will always exist? No, I think uh, this year we've seen a slight increase in working capital in many of our businesses. And I think uh, also there's some, uh, you know, for example, in the case of uh, Ethiopia, right, uh, because we had a debt issue, we kind of advanced significant amounts of money to uh, places like Google where we advertise to kind of secure those funds. So I think it also got skewed because of that. I think we should continue generating good cash in FY24. We expect to generate good cash. I think the other place our working capital got stuck or got sucked in is uh, the you know gaming accessories business in Ring, which is uh, a working capital intensive business. So we are working closely with the team on how can we create uh, you know better cash flow management uh, so that uh, you know working capital doesn't get uh, sucked in there continuously. Got it. So, uh, is it fair to say that you know the steady state EBITDA uh, to operating cash flow conversion would settle at a higher rate? Like, would it be like 40 50 percent of your yes, EBITDA? Absolutely. Yeah. Got it. Thanks, Nitish, and all the best. Yeah. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Deep Shah from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Um, hey, good morning, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so the first question was around um, the some qualitative commentary on uh, the Valorant Challenger Tour. The context is last year we had a deal with Star Sports uh, thanks to VGMI, and, and I hear you alluded that some media deals uh, have have lapsed because of uh, games being banned. So any uh, rough metrics they can call out as to what is the engagement levels for Valorant and that can give us some guidance on when those those media deals come back because if I understand correctly, more than the monetization, it is the reach um, which would have been large which Star Sports as a partner. So that so shall I, I'll just answer that first. So the BGMI or Star Sports, you know, was the first uh, 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 first program we ran with Star Sports, and that was extremely successful. We had, uh, you know, great response and, uh, you know, Star Sports was very excited about season two of things. However, because of uh, the BGMI ban, we could not kind of continue with that. And that was also one of the reasons our media revenue kind of dropped or not didn't grow as we expected in the previous year, FY23. Uh, Valorant is early days, the league has just launched and we will be building up. You know, Valorant versus BGMI, the difference is that Valorant is a PC game with a slightly smaller community compared to BGMI. It is more intense community, but from a visibility point of view, viewership point of view, it's a bit smaller. So we are kind of building it out uh, before we take it uh, you know, with a large channel. The other other media content that is done well for us is the Playground series. Season one you know, got about 17 million viewers. Season two got about 40 million viewers. We have season three launching in June. And that this is actually a changing the format a bit and going to run a, a year long uh, season. So I think uh, that should also be very positive for us. Right, Samus. So, second question. So, I hear in your opening remarks, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I hear that everything leverage has started playing out in the esports market this year. Um, uh, but I was rather thinking that profitability would be protracted given that we have a lot more new IPs, a lot more marketing required, uh, given given that, as you rightly said, Valorant is a different game than BGMI. So how could you think about this this profitability, please? Will it be protracted or 
we see a lot of epilepsy start growing right from FY24. And, and as a parallel question, um, what is the plan for new IPs? Anything which can uh, help us understand? Sure. So, so I think just to summarize, if I understood your question, you're asking about uh, the e-sports margins in uh, FY24. Uh, yes, so should we see a pickup right in FY24 or will it take some time? And second, on the new IPs, or, or where do you see scaling up of existing IPs that we have? Yeah. Any any uh, your thoughts on, on uh, what the blue side there would be helpful? Yeah, so uh, I think in terms of margins, you know, we are still projecting specifically for Northern gaming. You know, uh, we are not in FY24 projecting large, you know, very large enhancements in Evita. We will try and optimize where possible, but our focus is going to continue to drive strategic uh, work in that business. I think uh, in terms of your second question of IP, right, uh, Valorant is one that uh, Nordman has already launched. They launched a chess league, which is also doing very well. So there are two or three uh, different leagues that Nordman is currently in the midst of launching or has launched, which we think will uh, build no strong IP. There is uh, a Kingfisher India Premiership 23, which has been announced. Uh, this is having games like Tekken 7 and Clash of Clans. There's a PUBG New State Pro Series Challenger Finale, which was done. So I think there's a lot of uh, IPs working progress, working with uh, major gaming publishers who want to do a larger India play. So I think there's a lot of activity happening there, and uh, you will see that build up happen throughout uh, FY24. Uh, uh, sure, sir. Uh, this is very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. A reminder to participants to press star and one to ask a question. We have a next question from the line of Mukul Gar from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Thank you. I, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, hi. Okay. Hey, Mr. Good morning. Uh, so it is just a follow-up on uh, on the Nordwin uh, you know point. Uh, if you look at uh, either the content view or the distribution, uh, you know between Q4 FY22 and Q4 FY23, uh, it obviously has come off a bit. Uh, I just wanted to get your sense on you know how should we uh, think about uh, you know the opportunities playing out uh, over the longer term. This quarter we you know we were uh, trying to do that through Valorant and ESL, uh, but uh, clearly the response has not been uh, you know up to what BGMI or FIFA were kind of receiving in uh, you know from uh, players. So how how are you kind of visualizing the longer term uh, opportunity capture which is out there in the space? Uh, because you know uh, you have been able to grow your revenues quite smartly, uh, but that is uh, probably more because of broadening of uh, offering rather than the you know, viewership or distribution. Yeah. No, absolutely. So I think uh, you're going on that uh, in terms of uh, you know the viewership is obviously got impacted uh, due to the game set for bank. See, we need we need very popular mobile gaming titles in a country like India to drive maximum viewership and. Uh, one of two things will happen. Either the, the space that is currently there will get filled up by some new titles or titles, or you will have some of the you know existing titles come back, which is also an up, which is also possible in uh, the next few months. So I think uh, while that happens, uh, obviously we are working on creating many other IPs. We do see Valorant etc. also building out. Uh, you know we are working closely with them and uh, building it out. But uh, to see a large search, I think you need to get those uh, large mobile esports titles on the back of which a uh, lot of shit can be generated. Right. So, uh, you know, just to follow up on this, uh, you know, uh, are there any you know potential names which you are seeing, uh, which you know which are uh, in the pipeline, or uh, are you in discussions with uh, the government in, in terms of you know what the scenario in terms of uh, you know, the uh, Free Fire or BGMI, uh, which were quite popular in the country, uh, to kind of get them uh, back uh, as an option. 
he also know we, we actively as an important stakeholder in this whole space right uh, we are obviously interacting both with government uh, as well as the publishers to see what solutions can be found here and we are very hopeful that some some positive news will come in in the, in the coming months right uh, that said there are you know other games like call of duty mobile etc that we are working with so i think uh, focus is on expanding uh, the titles that we work with as well as working closely with the publishers to see whether some important titles can be relaunched yeah uh, and this second question was you know again a uh, related question uh, when i look at uh, WCC performance uh, in terms of this we uh, has been weaker than what it was same time last year. Uh, you have uh, on the other hand increased the stake uh, in next wave. So uh, any thoughts on you know how uh, you are kind of visualizing uh, your investment into the space? Uh, there's a lot of strategies happening on the mobile gaming side. Uh, you know, are you uh, hoping to kind of uh, aggressively expand uh, and create an alternate opportunity here? Yeah. yeah, so I think uh, we, we are at a point where we think uh, that uh, WCC can be starting to scale, you know. Uh, we've always been focused on KPIs, and I think our LTV calculation over there is starting to make sense. So we will hope, I think for the franchise that World Cricket Championship is in India, the kind of monetization we do today or even the kind of user base we have is relatively low. And there's a lot more that can be done in terms of scaling this up. So I think that's our plan for FY24, that how do we monetize this product better and how do we, uh, you know, uh, scale up the user base so that we have a multiplier effect on the overall business. We also brought in a chief operating officer recently who joined us from a large gaming studio and is working very closely with the team to kind of action some of the uh, things we want to implement. Sure. Uh, so, uh, should we expect, uh, you know, kind of front-ended investments uh, to, uh, you know, kind of uh, generate the required growth uh, or are we already seeing a tipping point and uh, you know, we feel that the growth can happen while uh, you, know, you are still uh, kind of getting a favorable uh, uh, returns on the investments? Yeah. No, I think uh, we don't anticipate large investments in terms of, you know, uh, SG&A costs, etc. But uh, I think uh, in the near future, we will potentially, you know, ramp up our user acquisition on that uh, product uh, to scale the user base. Got it. Uh, thanks for answering my question and uh, best of luck for uh, the quarter side. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Abhishek Kumar from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, um, uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, first, uh, I just noticed that uh, we have not given any guidance for FY24. Um, so just any sense on how are we looking at the overall portfolio growth uh, and also how should we look at margins now? Uh, things appear to have stabilized. So, in yes. color on, on growth and guidance for next year, growth and yeah. margin, sorry. So, so Abhishek, we are not, uh, not giving a guidance at this point of time. As you've seen, uh, since we listed, we have usually given guidance in September, one year or better, because of the whole year. But our intent this year is to obviously uh, you know, enhance margins in businesses where we can uh, and choose certain businesses which will continue to drive strategic growth uh, for you know market leadership. So, I think we'll continue following the same approach. Generally, overall sense of mind today is that there, there should be some margin improvement in the overall year. Great. Uh, now, second question is, is on real money gaming. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, regulatory clarity has emerged uh, over the past couple of months with uh, self-regulatory body uh, and uh, even on TDS. Uh, mm -hmm. And and we have also talked about a larger blueprint now in RMG. So just wanted you to flesh out, uh, you know, what would that mean? What would that entail, both in terms of organic and inorganic strategy? Yeah. So like I mentioned in my opening remarks, there are three uh, ways we are approaching this. One is how can our existing RMG businesses, especially open play, which runs a classic company brand, uh, grow fast and more aggressively. Uh, while Anupia mentioned there was a short-term blip because of the TN ban, where uh, this game is quite popular, I think that's a short-term noise for us. Uh, but we are looking at the larger picture, how can we really scale that business up? 
That's point number one. Point number two is we are working with many new game developers, uh, sorry, many developers and global companies to publish RNG games in India, which are innovative and new and you know scale them up and i think with this framework is we can do it a lot more confidently we can invest more aggressively in them build our user base and you know scale revenue so i think that's the second thing we've been actively working in and the third is we are in talks with uh, various uh, existing rng players to see whether there is consolidation or possibly possible so i think uh, this is these uh, three actions we are looking to definitely start scaling our R&D business uh, going forward. Okay, just one clarification. You said you're working with global uh, publishers. So are we also looking at expanding beyond Rami in R&D? Yeah, most definitely. So just to clarify, our focus on R&D is the Indian market. But uh, we are definitely looking at launching new games outside of Rami as well uh, in the Indian market, which are fresh and new and will be appealing to the consumer base here. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you and all the best. Sure. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Rahul Jain from Dollar Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my question is pertaining to uh, the uh, gamified business, uh, Kidopia and Animal Jam. Uh, I know you shared some of your thoughts earlier, but to uh, I think from a, a real growth addition point of view, I think uh, this segment would play an important uh, part in this year. So if you could uh, share beyond what you just shared in terms of uh, the stability and eventual uh, progress. So how you uh, see the uh, demand uh, based on the revised pricing and the churn behavior? And when you think would be, what is the uh, data point that you would watch out for before you, you know, kind of uh, speed up the pedal uh, to drive your uh, marketing spend here to drive growth? And how the revival uh, on the cost side and uh, in terms of content side shaping up in Animal Jam? And what kind of growth one should uh, envisage over the next four to six quarters there? So, so on Kidopia, one thing we sell is we launched a lot of new uh, content and features which are quite appealing to the consumers, both parents and kids. For example, the coding uh, for kids which has been launched in Kidopia has been very well appreciated. And I think uh, parents are willing to spend the extra money that we have in increased prices right, from 7.99 to 9.99 without, uh, without hesitating. And that reflects in our KPIs like John, which is if you see the last four quarters or five quarters that we have shown uh, in this is pretty constant, uh, you know, irrespective of the price. I think that is the good news that, uh, uh, and the way that's going to help is, uh, you know, with our cost per trial in control and the price increase, our margins in FY24 are going to look much healthier than what they were in FY23. Because uh, LTV CAC ratio has uh, you know improved significantly, so I think that that's one aspect. Now, what we are basically seeing is while keeping our cost of trial, let's say between thirty-five to thirty-seven dollars, how can we increase our spend from a million dollars a month to you know significantly more? What we don't want to do is again break the cost for trial, uh, you know, range that we have established. So we don't want to you know take it to forty dollars plus. So we kept a guardrail there. And the team is working actively on various channels to see how we can start increasing things within this uh, guardrail of cost per trial so that our margins are also protected. Coming on to uh, Animal Jam, I think we are very excited with what we've seen in the last few months after the acquisition. We spent a lot of time uh, getting our group on data. I think the data is uh, very interesting and uh, is showing some healthy results already. In Q4, if you see, we've also worked a lot on optimizing various into the business. So if you see uh, Q4, FY23, you know, we've seen a growth in uh, EBITDA margins to 11.6%. And we think we should get this business very quickly to about a 20% uh, EBITDA margin. And we we'll going from there. A lot of product work is happening on, uh, you know, features that can help monetization better. But one of the challenges with Animal Jam we found was that, you know, 
the conversion to monetization was fairly low because uh, you know the features that were implemented did not uh, did not make the people pay play love. Ninety five percent of the game was being played for free, and I think we are tweaking some of those things uh, which will help us improve conversions and scale the revenues. So very excited about Animal Jam as well. It's a very strong IP within the consumer base. And I think in game, gaming, as long as you are owning good IPs, there's a lot more you can do with it. So Philopia and Animal Jam are, you know, strong IPs in this sector. And there's a lot more we can do with them going forward. Does that answer your question, Mr. J? Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please press star and one on your phone. We have our next question from the line of Mohana Kumar, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Congrats on a great set of numbers and it's been a pretty solid last couple of years. So I just wanted to get some qualitative um, understanding of what the growth could look like in the over the next year. I, I understand that, you know, it's still very early and you probably are comfortable providing uh, numbers towards the second half of the year. But uh, do you feel that the, the growth trend that we've seen uh, can actually continue to grow organically, um, if not at the same rate as last couple of years, but at, a, at maybe like a 10 to 15 percent range of what we've seen in the last couple of years? Yeah, yeah. I think again, without giving any specific guidance, I think we will continue to drive, uh, you know, for growth in all our businesses uh, uh, wherever we can. And as these businesses continue to generate cash, we will keep redeploying these cash, uh, you know, that's accumulating into organic as well as organic growth. So I think we will see good organic growth. Uh, I don't want to give a specific number there, but it should be not of what you just spoke about. And. Um... Which is a business where you see where you feel that the margin expansion is going to drive the uh, expansion for the broader group uh, group right now? You mentioned that you're expecting uh, in a few of these uh, few of these sub uh, sub segments, but where are you expecting a larger the biggest chunk to actually come from? I think we should see a good uh, margin expansion in our gaming business overall uh, with Philopia and. Uh, you know, WCC as well as Animal Jam. So I think these products should continue to drive a fairly good margin expansion in FY24. We also expect sports data to do well uh, in terms of margins. So yeah, I think uh, leaving aside our not even e-sports business where we are not projecting large margin expansion, I think other businesses all will be upwards, I think uh, upward tick on margins. Sounds good. Uh, thanks a lot and all the best for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Rahil Shah, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Am I audible? Sure. Yes, sir. So, uh, I understand uh, you're not giving any guidance on the EBITDA margins. The question is a little more far ahead in the future. So, I wanted to ask, what uh, have you envisioned a number, a, a potential or steady state EBITDA margins when your investments in new business verticals reduced and these businesses stabilized. So have you have you targeted any number or if not targeted, can you just share with us any number which is, you know, your confident is possible? Yeah, sure. So do you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, right. Just so I can understand what you were saying, uh, you're asking for each of the businesses or overall? No, no, no. Overall, so you know, you are in a process of scaling up. You know, you're investing a lot in your business verticals, correct? So I'm just asking, when you when you're done with this and when this business is stabilized, what kind of potential of steady state EBITDA margins you you are confident that you will be able to achieve? Sure. So um, I think one is uh, each of our segments. If you look at it right, um, so right now we are very much in. Uh, very fast growth uh, because a lot of investment which is happening in uh, the current year, in the previous year, as you've seen. Uh, and we do expect that phase to continue for a little bit. So I think uh, when we say what are the steady state of the numbers, uh, we may need to look a little further in the future than just six months or a year or two years. Uh, 
we can look at uh, segment by segment. Uh, if we start with each course, I think definitely on that uh, you will see applications, similar kind of margin structures to what we have today for the near future, uh, because that opportunity is probably the largest in terms of absolute growth numbers uh, currently. Uh, down the road, we do expect it to be, uh, especially as the media properties kick in and the IP get much higher value, uh, that should be a very highly profitable segment as well, in line with what you would see in the media world. So I prefer you to look at steady state, uh, uh, sorry, steady state uh, margins there. Uh, on the gaming side, uh, we definitely uh, see already uh, about a 20% kind of margin structure uh, in the businesses. And that number will expand in the near future. And longer term steady state, I mean, if I have a guess, I'd probably go around a 30% kind of a number. Uh, but again, it might take a bit more time in investment before we get there. Uh, I'd take it a different kind of business. That's more of a services business. In, and that uh, current numbers are closer to 9 or 10%, as you would have seen, uh, which will expand a bit, but not hugely as long as it stays focused on services. There are some product type possibilities in that as well, which if those come through, then that uh, increases the margin uh, significantly over time. But uh, at this point, we don't have to I'm sorry, I hope that answers. Okay, okay, yeah, that's helpful. And uh, another would be, um, why have uh, our profit margins dropped uh, significantly in Q4 compared to Q3? So I'm just trying to understand, is, is it because of like the seasonality factor or what happens in Q4? And when do you expect it to revise? Um, I think uh, I was just actually looking more at a broader picture for the year rather than because uh, there are these there are seasonal variations as well, business specific ones as well, which are called out mm -hmm. at the different uh, business segments uh, rather than giving a yeah. answer on this. So, yeah, but just to just to add to that, uh, um, so our margin, our EBITDA margin for Q3 was nine point seven percent. Uh, which came at 9.6 percent in Q4. Given Q3 is uh, you know a high uh, margin business for many of our products because sports leader, for example, in the US uh, realizes very high ECPM during this period. And similarly to some of the other businesses, Q3 is a high seasonal business quarter. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we we've done fairly well with the margin actually in Q4, 9.6 percent. If you compare it uh, to the previous year, also we improved it was 8.5 percent in Q4 of FY22, uh, whereas it's 9.6 uh, percent in Q4 of FY23. Okay, okay, that's okay, sir. Uh, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Rahul Jain from Dollar Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, Rahul. Uh, Hi, uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity again. Uh, just one uh, more incremental input on the, the ad tech business, uh, specifically that we are uh, more targeting this in the uh, US market. So uh, how you are seeing that market shaping up, we also saw uh, a client impact. So how you see in light of a relatively uh, weakening macro trend in that market. And of course, uh, we have a very strong client addition uh, matrix. So how it should balance out uh, during this year in your view? Uh, Rahul, uh, we see that the services that DataWorks offers and also back to some of the new products they've launched, uh, they've launched a platform for MediaWorks and they've also launched a platform product on Visible. We think there's a lot of value proposition for clients and uh, because DataWorks uh, operates much of its uh, you know, team and operations from India, there's a lot of arbitrage saving that they can offer to the clients and decides you know, better results. So I think uh, the weakening uh, market in the US should not uh, hurt DataWorks much because clients will look to optimize costs and actually DataWorks may benefit from that. Uh, new clients signing up has been going on at a, a very good rate. There's a lot of uh, efforts that the team is doing there. So we're very optimistic about this business uh, into FY24. We also see some very interesting bolt-on opportunities there, which can actually enhance margins by you know acquiring uh, convincing entities in the US and uh, Europe, which we are currently looking at. So I think overall we can uh, you know see good growth, good margins in this business, and the new products that we have launched will also add value to that over a period of time. 
Right, right. And uh, you did this uh, transaction of pro football. Uh, I think it's a uh, fantastic transaction given the large opportunity. And I was looking at some of the peers which are much, much larger than what this company is, uh, it has achieved. Of course, this is a very young company. So uh, if you could give more input in terms of uh, what are the uh, scalability opportunity here, is there any synergy to existing uh, SK business? And also, is there any meaningful seasonality in terms of the, the, way, the way they uh, recognize their revenue? Yeah, sure. So I think, uh, uh, of course, NFL season probably uh, happens in Q2, Q3. So Q1, for example, is the lowest uh, season for uh, Pro Football Network. But uh, the team at Sportskeeda has a lot of ideas, a lot of synergies actually with Pro Football Network. So even in this new season, we've actually seen significant uh, uptick in some of the KPIs of Pro Football Network since we've kind of acquired them. So it's probably it's probably a small transaction uh, within uh, you know our network, but uh, we are very excited about uh, this opportunity. At this uh, point of time, uh, if, uh, if I may just add a yeah. couple of points, guys. Yeah. Uh, so, Ron, I think uh, want to emphasize that uh, uh, pro football is about American football, obviously, which is uh, what we in India sometimes call rugby, but American football, and that's actually the largest sport in the world, uh, not just in the US and other the market, larger than uh, soccer, football, or larger than cricket. And uh, PSN is a unique uh, property in the, uh, or, I mean, they built something very interesting and they're growing very rapidly, obviously. Uh, uh, seasonality wise, uh, the American football season lasts broadly corresponding to Q2, Q2 and Q3 of our year. So for us, we've seen this quarter, Q1 as an opportunity to sort of build a lot of, uh, uh, build further on the product side there and look at the synergy between uh, Sports Kida and them with their art. Uh, and Q2, Q3 is what will actually show the results, uh, we hope, uh, in that. But we do expect this to be a significant driver of value for sports Kira overall in the coming years. Right. Uh, thanks for that additional color. Just uh, a, li a little bit more curious about the opportunity size. Because when I see this space, I see that there is one or two players which are significantly larger than what we are. Uh, and, of course, they, they are very uh, old business that way. <clears throat> And there are a lot of uh, lot of uh, sites which are dedicated to particular uh, league or uh, team, uh, and that is also a huge market. So, is there something uh, that we could do to consolidate this space? Because otherwise, uh, I think there is a lot of loyalty-led uh, uh, volume or uh, content consumption that happens uh, in this market. Uh, uh, for us to scale to a meaningful level, or you think uh, independent uh, entity covering the entire sport is uh, what could trend uh, in the future? Uh, which part is that? Um, so, uh, I think that's definitely an interesting and important point there, right? which is uh, the way uh, customers and viewers consume content on this. Uh, many of them will be very loyal to specific teams or uh, regions and uh, or even say college football teams. Uh, and they follow that with a great deal of passion. So one way to grow this segment, which uh, the Sports Kira and the PSN team are very focused on, is looking at how do you target those individual communities with segments. Uh, and uh, there are different kinds of answers on that, and the team is kind of very focused on uh, on, on using that insight and also doing that. Um, I'll, I'll be just a bit careful on what we say here, because... Uh, uh, it's not just one website. It is definitely much more that they do. Uh, and that, that uh, insight which you shared around, that's definitely one thing that they message. Sure, sure. Thanks for that. Thank you so much. That's it from my side. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to management for closing comments. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for spending the time today on the call. We look forward to continuing to strive hard to deliver you know, good results in FI24 and beyond, and look forward to your ongoing support and feedback. Thank you very much. On behalf of JM Financial, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your